we're just waiting for our guests to arrive so we can share them with you and share their insights. While we're waiting for our um, wonderful guests to come and join you, would you like to introduce the topic and just talk a little bit about it? Because you're a wealth of information and everybody's waiting to hear uh, anything and everything that you you have to say about this. Yeah, so the this is a very interesting topic. And, and what's really fascinating about it, it very much mirrors the asbestos topic. So many people around the world will be familiar with asbestos. And this was a substance that was really talked about as the miracle mineral. You know, there were so many thousands of products and it was houses made from it, there were fire blankets, all sorts of things. And it turned out that the science knowing the dangers of asbestos was actually known since 1898. What happened was that the dangers were suppressed and the paid experts, the scientists, the politicians, or the industry that was making so much money covered up all the negative opinions. Now, what's fascinating is now that this sort of what we term as radio frequency radiation, which many of you will know as 5G and 4G, really mirrors um, what we're seeing going on um, from industry again. So I was really startled to find out just how many scientific studies there are showing biological effects from radiation from wireless really, really start in the amount of them. I mean, on fertility alone, that I, I remember looking at 135 studies thinking, oh my God, this is incredible. So yeah, it's very fascinating. I've also had a, a personal um, experience of having some issues with my health regarding the wireless. So when I, I sort of used all ethernet within my house, those issues really disappeared within a few days. So it's really sort of seeing is believing. So, yeah, it's a very fascinating topic. It's one that I think every member pretty much in the countries that we're in will be exposed to these things. And, and it's really something that we can significantly reduce our exposure to. So uh, did Oliver arrive? We have all of our guests. I've given them all permission to speak. So they should be able to um, unmute themselves and turn on their cameras if they'd like to. Brilliant. So, uh, could you give uh, a minute or two of your uh, involvement in the radio radiation? Uh, sure, yes. Um, before I, I defer to greater authority and experience. Um, so, I've been working for several years in the, in the UK. Um, uh, so, in the background, there have been some amazing pioneers in bringing a judicial review against the government in Britain who have been uh, adhering to the ICNAP guidelines, of course, and effectively mandating this rollout. So there's a lot of kickback. But as we all realise, the legal system is is in incredibly robust in uh, refuse. It has very four years. It will not listen to evidence. It will not listen to the public. It's not democratic. It is a problem the world over. But uh, I've just, I've been interested as a campaigner and also as an architect because. Uh, obviously, one of the key factors for healthy buildings is having a healthy electromagnetic environment. And we've known this for 100 years, of course. So when I realized again how the microwave radiation in the environment was intensifying very rapidly, it was also doing so within the home. So I would also say that we must also, as, as ever, do the internal work, but literally internal to our home and not just our body, but the home. Because it's too easy to get distracted with masks and the external uh, hardware that's being rolled out. But do, of course, pay attention to mitigating the, the Wi-Fi and the mobile phone or the device radiation in your houses. Uh, because that is our sanctuary. That is our safe zone. And as Olga Sheehan uh, made very clear to the United Nations, you know, there is no safe place anymore outside. So um, they're, they're vanishing very rapidly, at least. So we need to make sure we clean up our houses. Uh, so I'm just working with UK campaigners, trying to clarify the arguments more and more and more in um, apprehending the planning system and trying to alert councillors and planning officers to their duty of care. It's, it's incredible, it's outrageous, it's unlawful that they should be ignoring all this evidence and thinking they can hide behind guidelines, uh, which the government have dressed up as mandatory, but they're not. You know, policy is not law. Um, it's not uphill battle because... As we know, everybody has 
cognitive dissonance about this. It's a complicated topic in some ways, but in other ways it's incredibly simple and common sense, which is why you tend to find the same people understanding the radiation issues as understand the COVID issues. It's just about having a, a simple common sense approach to understanding how life should and does work and not being baffled by experts. So yeah, that's my little background of the UK. But we should trust experts such as Matt. And you know, I think the key point there is the independent experts and and that's really key. The, the funding from where studies come from plays a significant role on on the focus. Um, I know we've got some very experienced UK campaigners on the call tonight as well. Um, I know well, one thing we're trying to emphasise uh, in our presentations or representations to councils is that is referring back to the New Hampshire Commission study, which actually was published, but where it's just it's just um, gone through the legislation and, and hearings in America. But that's referring to studies carried out over 10 years in Brazil, um, covering about 1,500 different sites and establishing that there has to be a 500 metre setback distance from each mast uh, to guarantee a slightly better, more sustainable level of public protection. Um, it, rather than the official ICNAP guidelines, which are roughly 50 metres. Um, so, you know, the, the evidence is incredibly robust and these planning officials should be taking note of that and applying precautionary refusals in a precautionary approach. Not even precautionary, because there's nothing to be cautious about. It's preventing. They should be preventing this type of exposure within at least 500 metres. But that's public health. Of course, there are the much bigger issues as well. There's the environmental impact of 5G and 4G and this terrifying rollout, which is it, it just crucifies any green targets that any government or self-respecting council wants to meet. Uh, whatever we think about the validity of that even. But the pollution obviously is valid and um, and the surveillance issues. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of angles to this, aren't there, David? Uh, are you able to share your experience with the college? Uh, yes. My son is at a boarding school in Britain, which means that he lives he he lives there. You know, they sleep there. That's what boarding schools are in Britain and America. And um, in their wisdom, they had decided to take out the Ethernet, uh, which was the old style connection, of course, and install Wi-Fi access points in every single room as well as, of course, every classroom and every other public space in the college. And uh, I was horrified because uh, they, they're sleeping in those rooms 24 hours a day. They're working there, sleeping there, and they're in classrooms exposed to this radiation. And they are industrial grade routers. So when I first contacted the IT department, uh, one of these staff members said that, uh, said I shouldn't be concerned because he's got a physics degree. Uh, you know what happens next. Uh, so he was quite convinced that non-ionizing radiation has no no effect on biological systems. So, you know, it took me about half an hour to do the research myself and find out that was complete nonsense. And it took two years to persuade the school to at least appoint an independent expert of their choice who happened to have a, a knighthood for services to British military radar technology. So the, my hopes weren't raised too much, but to his credit, on page 13 of his report, he had been persuaded by Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe's uh, evidence and witness statements um, to accept that there was at least enough of a smoking gun to warrant a precautionary approach where children are concerned, which is what we all agree with. And you know, that was my red line that at night, at least there should be a white zone the boys it should be switched off in their bedrooms at night that's the low-hanging fruit for a for a college of course just to switch it off at night it doesn't upset all the classroom etiquette um but at least yeah they have that white zone now and they did follow that advice from this guy um so they can tick their lists uh you know they've done more than any other school because really it took two two and a half years of badgering them and not many parents are that stubborn uh, but we hoped it would set a benchmark perhaps for others. We've got liability notices ready to go out to schools in Britain now. Yeah, thank you, for that, Oliver. I think what I've noticed when I talk to people that sleeping issues is one of the major things that we see with people. And I know that so many people I've spoke to, all I said to them is turn your Wi-Fi off at night, don't have your phone 
hear you. And the amount of times that I've seen them the next time, they go, oh my God, I sleep so well now. And that really, I think, is really the first door for a lot of people to go into, that when you experience an improved sleep from having no, you know, a cleaner, less radiated environment, then you start to realize, ah, oh, there might be something to this. And obviously some, you know, it's not so easy in modern day life to completely switch yourself off, but it's actually relatively straightforward, isn't it, to, to have a house completely ethernet. And as you, as Magda's connecting her phone, so I've got a tablet that I have connected by ethernet, I have my laptop, I have all of my applications. So my phone is hardly ever accessing Wi-Fi or mobile data. And I think that's one of the easiest things that we can do. And, and you have on the side a, a lot of ways that people can do this. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's on the rfinfo.co.uk site. But the Environmental Health Trust, obviously, is a fantastic resource as well internationally. And there's lots of tips on there for safer use of technology. Uh, none of us say safe use because there's no such thing. But at one point I do threat, you know, I, is um just as a campaigner is that um we fundamentally we mustn't be afraid so that the stronger our vitality the stronger our positivity the the um more robust our etheric field our our um, emotional fields are you know physically we will be more resilient to this and obviously when we drop drop into fear as with covid as with anything we are more vulnerable so please stay in a state of unconditional acceptance but dynamic um dynamic uh, sort of campaign uh what is it so frontline frontline action to be dynamic there but to be unconditional in the way we approach the, the dangers as well so there's also been a number of sort of court cases going on and there's i think there's a number of victories in a number of countries isn't there where they started to remove wi-fi from schools I think the, the dangers are being recognized quite quickly, aren't they, as things happen. And there's also many things that we can do that are really simple, aren't they, that, that make life a lot uh, easier and safer, such as, you know, if you have your phone in your pocket and you're a man, then it's wise to have airplane mode on or turn the mobile data and the Wi-Fi off. Um, I mean, some of the studies that hopefully when Magda comes on, there was a lot of studies and slides that she had shown um, that when you get to see it with your eyes, the, the things that are going on where they do the, uh, the measurements with the sperm counts and the blood counts, etc. And this thing becomes very real, doesn't it? It's no longer this invisible thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, as we probably a lot of people here realize, there are thousands of studies um, going, dating back to Fifties, the Naval Medical Research Institute, those that are declassified on the Tory Glazer's website, and also the Australian-based website. Uh, they've known about it forever, and uh, radiation sickness from radar, which is very long wavelength, as well, uh, has been known about for a long time. And it's a total fallacy that it's not a thermal-only effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though the mechanisms in terms of sort of physics are not entirely understood, the fact that we can see the effect it is proof enough, of course, isn't it? Yeah, um, I recall reading the the symptoms from, you know, if you were having too much exposure, the number one symptom was headaches. Mm. And I know that a lot of people were having increasing amounts of headaches over the last few years. And then sleep was, uh, again, one of the top, the uh, top symptoms. And of course, there's a sleep epidemic in the UK. So what mm. I find fascinating is that a lot of people... Um, obviously, we don't want to believe that it's dangerous. It would be much easier, wouldn't it, if it was really safe? But I think the studies are very, very clear. And of course, when we when we find this out, then the question is, how do we protect ourselves? How do we make sure our environment is healthy? And of course, it's not something we want to believe is dangerous. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, yeah, if it was dangerous, then we would see an increase in illness. And of course, when you look, there's exactly that. <laughs> a lot of the illnesses, I remember looking at some of Ollie Johansson's statistics that in you know the last five, ten years, some of the increases have been really huge. And I know um hopefully we'll get Ollie on one time and he's you know some of the studies they've done. I remember a quote that he said that was really powerful. He said he sort of wishes every day that he was wrong or safe. 
But the chances of that, the chance of there being 25,000 studies proving dangers, all being incorrect, is just almost non-existent, isn't it? Yes. So that's why I think it's, it's at this place where to really understand what the mechanisms are. And I think one of the most fascinating ones is um, this, and I don't know if it's, if it's easy enough to give some analogies, this VGCC, is it possible to give a quick sum on this? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, Dr. Martin Powell's uh, research, voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, I'm sure Magda is probably best qualified to explain, but there are, it, it's just, it's incredible. We all know we've had to learn so much in the last three years or two years now about everything. And so it's fascinating what one can learn, just even about bioelectronics or electrobiology, um, just to understand how incredibly sophisticated and sensitive a cell membrane is. So the cell membrane has all these different gates which let in different salts. And uh, they're not just um, single charge gates, you know, activated by single charges or ions, but they're also ones that, that are controlled by hormones and controlled mechanically, so that ligand gates and all sorts of incredible gates. But um, Martin Powell discovered that the voltage-gated channels are particularly sensitive, of course, to passing electromagnetic radiation. Um, 70, 70 million times more sensitive than other single charge groups in the body as well. And so, long story short, basically they, they get interference and they get told to open when they should be closed and close when they should be open, but more open than closed. So there seems to be an excess of calcium ion influx to the cells and that causes a chain reaction in uh, the cellular pathways, so the proxy nitrite chain. And that leads basically to oxidative stress. And we know everybody, even the NH NHS in England know that oxidative stress is uh, a cause of cellular degeneration and devitalization. So uh, and lots of things cause oxidative stress, but that comes on due to the plausible deniability of this radiation. The, the symptomology and the, the non-linear dose response, as they call it, is, um, is so subtle that it can manifest in many different ways in many different people. There's not just one symptom associated with radiation sickness. And it takes 10, 15, 20 years for us to show particular symptoms sometimes. Even with the thermal effects, you know, these tumors are against the head, it's still taking 10 or 15 years generally to show up. So you can imagine that the non-thermal or slightly more distant radiation effects could take a generation. But that's what they're seeing with mice and rats. It's nearly over the lifetime of a rat that you end up with these with these problems. Um, so it's causing a, a, a more rapid decline in, in general health, it seems, and all this inflammation. The plausible deniability, that's the problem. You know, we can't smell it, we can't see it, we can't taste it, touch it, or or hear it. And all the other industrial pollutants have had some association with our physical senses. But even then, we could see them, touch and smell them. It took 30 to 60 years to recognize and regulate most of those things. So it doesn't look too hopeful. Um, but information is brilliant. You know, once we realize we can start taking steps, as David said, to, um, to mitigate it in our homes and in our environment and to sow seeds with people. And just, just to mention it, so we never know who's going to pick up on it. And we can learn pretty quickly who won't and then just move on. Yeah, I think one of the things that I I think that people find really useful is the the meters. Yeah. So do you want to say a few minutes? Because I, I we crowdfunded a meter in our hometown and we went around and, and measured people's houses. So yeah, could you I mean do you have a phone nearby that you could show someone a quick example? Yeah, yeah, I've got a phone because <laughs> they are useful. Um but it's usually on airplane mode. So if we turn this people aren't familiar with meters so that's showing the the background levels are very low this is in micro watts but don't worry too much about the units just go by the traffic lights so that's some background from the mast a couple of miles away but if i turn my phone on that's um that's booting up and uh, it goes on to Safari. Oh, okay. So, very, so that becomes very real, doesn't it? The invisible becomes visible. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I, I remember reading a few of the documentations in some of the booklets of these meters, and it would say 60 millivolts was really what you want to aim for, being lower than that. And we went around and measured some of the masts in our local area, and being sort of, sort of 200 yards away from them, we were already at 2,000 millivolts. So much, much, much higher. And I think that what we can do in, in the short term is really reduce our exposure significantly by just some really simple things as we talked about, Ethernet on the computer, you know, turning the Wi-Fi off. Because a lot of the time the Wi-Fi is not being used, is it? You know, if someone's on a laptop's Ethernet, there's no need for it to be on. So um, yeah, it's, it's very, very some really simple steps. And and you have those steps on the website, I do believe. Yes, yep, under safer use of tech. Um, so I'm sure there are people here with other resources to share as well. Just trying to make, have, have safety numbers as well, you know, many resources. There are lots of websites listed on my website. There are hundreds around the world. So quick Google search as well. Everything's at our fingertips, but it's, yeah. it's amazing how reluctant sometimes we are to look for it. So what was the first, the first, Exposure you had to realizing there might be an issue. Uh, it was twenty years ago. Uh, I was with that was a healthy buildings training with geomancy. So actually, that links back to the Building Biology Institute. And they're the ones that the Bio Initiative Report and other practitioners refer to as a reliable um, indicator of safe levels. The Building Biology Institute in Germany. And uh, they recommend levels which are right down in the green on these on these meters. But with geomancy, you learn about the invisible world. You, and this is invisible physical, but we we know, of course, there's the invisible non-physical and there's the invisible geopathic stress, which is part of geomancy, and uh, other factors in the environment, which have a big effect on, on biology and life. They're all there for a reason, but we need to sort of be a bit more sensitive to our environments and work out how to bring our houses into balance that they support us um but then it all for me just came back actually sasha stone's film you know i don't really know what path he's on but his film the um 5g apocalypse i'm very grateful for uh, a friend just texted it to me one day and again that to me that's the power of somebody gives you some unsolicited advice you know i welcome that because i don't know what i don't know and if it's not something that vibes me you can just turn it off but I watched it and that just woke me up to what's been going on in the last 15 years with the with the increase of Wi-Fi and obviously the rollout and improvements in, in mobile cellular technology. Um, so, yeah, the 5G apocalypse. Um, but, yeah, I moved on from that and there's a lot of good sound resources out there. Brilliant. Um, I could recommend something, um, David, a homegrown UK resource, which is... Um, the FHIRE, P-H-I-R-E, Medical Consensus Statement, which was put together, it was um, collated and curated by Erica, Dr. Erica mallory Bly, we mentioned earlier. And that's a fantastic study. She's amazing at condensing this complex subject into fully referenced, fully credible evidence from her experience as an expert witness as well. And she helps electrosensitive people. Um, it's about 10 pages long, and it's got three and a half thousand medical and scientific uh, signatories to it, plus many thousands of public ones. But it's very cre it's a very credible resource, and I think if you want the whole the whole topic in a nutshell, it's a very accessible read, being 10 yeah. pages. So it's a fire website, P H I R E. Thank you. Is that dot com dot? I'm just checking that. <laughs> It's, it's linked from my page as well. This is one of the things that really fascinates me about when people make statements about, you know, uh, any dangers to wireless being a conspiracy theory and all that. They never mm. actually quote substance to it. Mm. And pretty much like most of the things in the media, they pretend that there's a consensus. But I think the mm. consensus is quite the other way when it comes to radio frequency radiation. Certainly when I looked at the EMS scientist website, and I don't know how many EMS scientists there can be in the world, but there's hundreds of them that have signed a petition, isn't there? And, and there was another one where there was hundreds of thousands of people were signing petition to to have you know guidelines looked into, wasn't there? Yeah, there's a there's the EMF call and there's the 5G appeal. 
Uh, this one is firemedical.org. So P H I R E medical.org. And of course, so, Amanda, if you could introduce yourself, please, and, and, and describe some of the misconceptions of 5G for us. Are you talking to me, David? I'm having such. Okay, the thing is, I'm having a really hard time um, hearing what you're saying. For some reason, my cell phone isn't very loud, and I can't seem to connect it to the computer. I'm wondering if I could come back on a different day, David. Um, and, you know, once we've got this figured out, using Telegram when you have to connect with a cell phone is the exact wrong thing. No offense meant, but we're trying to get people off of their, you know, wireless technology. And if you're using a computer, you can at least wire it. I can wire my cell phone, but for some reason right now, it's just not working with, you know, the little time I have to set it up. So I'm wondering if I could come back another time. I had maybe spend just a few minutes um, giving us a, a, just a couple of lines on the misconceptions of 5G. The common misconception. Okay, great. I can do that. Um, so there are a number of misconceptions about 5G. Uh, one is 5G stands for fifth generation wireless technology. We've had, you know, four previous generations that um, increased the number of uh, channels that you can have. So change the frequency range that cell phones are communicating on, basically. Um, so 5G represents fifth generation. Uh, some people confuse it with five gigahertz, which is now being used for some Wi-Fi in, as well as 2.4 gigahertz. So five is also being used. And some people think that 5G and five gigahertz are the same thing and they're not. They're two totally different things. Five gigahertz is a frequency. It's like a radio station that you use to communicate. Uh, so it's a channel um, that's used to communicate. Um, the other misconception about 5G is that um, 5G consists of um, three different frequency bands. One is sub one gigahertz. Uh, another is sub five gigahertz. And the third is, uh, or sub um, six gigahertz, sorry. And the third is millimeter waves. So we've got technology that um, is over three different frequency ranges. Most people think that 5G simply means millimeter waves. What's novel about 5G compared to 4G are the millimeter waves. So that's what's different um, because the millimeter waves are um, the millimeter waves are really, really high um, intensity and really, really high frequency. And because of that, uh, because of the high frequency, we're unable to measure it on the devices. I noticed that Oliver was using his safe and sound RF meter to show what levels are in his uh, community. And um, what we're doing is um, um, we're unable to measure the millimeter waves because the technology that he's using goes up to eight gigahertz. And a lot of the technology only goes up to eight gigahertz. So they're designing new technology to actually measure the millimeter waves. Right now, it's far too pricey for the you know, average consumer, even for people who are professionally in this business, it's extremely expensive. But the good thing about it is that there are now maps where you can see if 5G has been activated in your community. 5G, unlike the other frequencies, uh, comes with something called a small cell. So it's a, a fairly small um, device, an antenna that's set up on, you know, power lines and, and um, other types of structures so that it can access information. Now, with the millimeter waves, they travel only short distances because they're absorbed by water very uh, effectively. Um, and so if it's raining, for example, it'll interfere somewhat with reception. So they actually put antennas, the small cell antennas, every two or 300 meters because they only reach a short distance. So basically when they're rolling out 5G, they're rolling out these small cell antennas. Now we've done some work where we've had people monitoring streets with and without 5G activated. And they're using the same meter that Oliver used previously. Um, so we're only measuring up to eight gigahertz. We can't measure the millimeter waves, but if you measure, if you compare 
up to eight gigahertz on streets with and without 5G um, um, activated, we're finding that the levels are more than double. They're much, much higher than they used to be. So when 5G comes into your community, you're reacting uh, potentially to all of the different frequencies, uh, even though we can't measure the millimeter waves. Um, the millimeter waves are supposedly not going to penetrate buildings. Uh, so that's, that's good news. And they're not supposed to penetrate the body very deeply. They penetrate just a few millimeters into the body. But that few millimeters is absolutely critical. We have a lot of nerve endings there. We have uh, sweat cells that um, are actually acting like antennas because they've got salty solutions. So they penetrate much more deeply. And if the skin is affected, it can cause all sorts of problems from you know, rashes to hives to any kind of irritation. And anyone who's had a skin irritation problem knows how awful that is. So the fact that they say that it only penetrates a few millimeters isn't something we should be happy about um, uh, because it can still have uh, negative health effects. And what we're finding is once 5G comes into a community, a, a whole new uh, group of people become sick they start having the symptoms of electrosmog, and that's because their level of tolerance has now been exceeded. Um, so those are the really the key things about 5G millimeter waves. It's also used um, as active um, uh, avoidance technology by the military. So they use 60, um, up, no, I think they use 90 gigahertz uh, for this um, active denial system, which is trying to uh, control crowds. And what they do is they take a truck with a large antenna on it. They aim it at people uh, who are in a crowd that they want to disperse and they simply hit the trigger and it sends out a, a 90 gigahertz uh, millimeter wave that's very powerful and it heats the body instantly, uh, incredibly painful. So anyone who has this, that, who is targeted by this technology can feel intense heat, very uncomfortable, and they get out of the way very quickly. So it's an effective crowd control without being um, um, lethal. You know, better 5G, sorry, better um, this active denial system than using guns. But it can still do a huge amount of damage, especially to the eyes. The eyes are very, very sensitive to any kind of microwave radiation. And millimeter waves are microwaves. So the real damage is to the cornea of the eye, uh, and cataracts are one of the consequences. So, you know, those are some of the key issues about 5G. The other thing that's happening with 5G, because it has so much, such a large bandwidth for uh, sending data, uh, it means it's going to be used where instantaneous access is necessary. So it's going to be used in vehicles that uh, are self driving vehicles. Um, and it's going to be used in a lot of other things that we can't do right now. So there's some, um, consequences to drivers, right? If you've got 5G in your car and you're electro hypersensitive and it affects your cognitive ability and your ability to react to a quick situation. So if someone drives in front of you and you're not thinking fast enough, you might not be able to stop. So there's a whole issue of people who are intolerant of this radiation to be driving safely um, because there's some real concern that they might not be doing that. Also, some of the biological effects include um, rouleau formation of the blood, heart problems, and you know people can end up having a heart attack if they've got a sensitivity there when they're exposed to this because the blood starts um, coagulating and it becomes harder to get the blood moving through uh, the blood vessel. So your blood pressure will go up, your heart rate will go up. Um, and if you've got sensitive heart, uh, you could even have a heart attack or a stroke. Um, with the rouleau formation of the blood. So we're talking about something that's really life-threatening, especially if someone's in a vehicle. Um, they can not only affect their own lives, but other people as well. So with that, I can, I can just stop and turn it back to you, David. Thank you very much, Magda. Could I ask you just one question, which I think is one of the important things, is the, its effect on sleep. Okay, well, I'm a terrific example of that. Um, People have a huge amount of difficulty. One of the symptoms is interrupted sleep. Um, they have difficulty falling asleep. They have difficulty staying asleep. If they wake up in the middle of the night, they have difficulty going back to sleep and they wake up exhausted. 
Um, so that's something that will ultimately lead to fatigue. And if it's long enough, it'll be chronic fatigue. Um, and certainly I have difficulty with my sleep. I'm trying all sorts of things. And one of the things that you can do for that is simply make sure that your bedroom is as electromagnetically clean as possible. Um, make sure that the levels are green on the meter if you happen to have a meter and that you, you don't have your bed near any kind of um, electric uh, uh, devices. So sometimes even moving your bed away from a wall is important because there's electricity flowing through the wall. And some people are actually sensitive to the low frequency electric and magnetic fields coming from electricity. So it definitely interferes with sleep. And the real problem with that is that our bodies heal um, when we're sleeping. That's when all the healing takes place. And so if you can't fall asleep, you're not going to heal. And consequently, any illness you have is simply going to get more and more severe. So a lot of the chronic illnesses that we have, mostly things like neurological illnesses, both in children and adults, is increasing exponentially, particularly in the United States. And I don't know why it's worse in the United States than uh, places like the UK, for example, or Canada. Um, but there's evidence that it's really having some very serious um, neurological consequences that are leading to deaths. So we're not talking about minor neurological disturbances. So sleep is incredibly important. Um, not using uh, your computer, uh, not being exposed to blue light, for example, um, uh, one or two hours before sleep is critical. Um, but sometimes even that isn't, isn't enough because you're exposed in your bedroom to radio frequency radiation. And having your cell phone next to you when it's on in the bedroom is probably the worst thing you can do. Uh, because cell phones periodically connect to an antenna. And so every few minutes, you're going to get a zip going through that your body's going to be exposed to if it's within arm's length. Thank you, Dr. That's uh, some very important information. I think going forward, people can obviously access this. I think the beauty of tonight is really people, you know, seeing it firsthand, getting to, to see the conversation. I know certainly from my own experience, um, we went and bought, we crowdfunded a really good meter and I went through, measured my whole, whole house and it was really only took me probably a day to put loads of solutions and my house is pretty much free now. It's almost zero. Um, and I noticed a huge difference to my health. Um, this was a number of years ago I did this. Um, and I periodically just check to make sure. And then I, there was one point, I think about six months ago, I wasn't sleeping very well and I didn't know why measured and then I and then it turned out that upstairs they put a Wi-Fi booster in the hallway which is right above my bedroom. So I because I'm the landlord, I was fortunate that it got up to and said, look, you need to move this and then the state went back to normal. Good. So yeah, it's something that those people that have seen the difference really, you know, you don't need to convince someone. When you I've said to so many oh. people, turn your phone off and then see how you sleep. And once you experience you go, okay. Because our conscious mind, it, it wants to believe that everything's okay. But when you get a beautiful night's sleep after not sleeping well, then that's, that's all the convincing that anyone needs really, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with you. One of the things I recommend to people is to um, turn off anything wireless in their home. Um, disconnect the electricity from the bedroom if they can and see how they sleep. And if their sleep improves, that tells them the whole yeah. story. Brilliant. And you've been studying this for many years now, haven't you? And of course, we were talking earlier, this isn't just a theory. The study, this, there's literally tens of thousands of studies, isn't there? Oh, yeah. This has been ongoing since the early 1900s, believe it or not. It was called neurasthenia then, which means a weakening of the nervous system, which is a perfect um, label for electrohypersensitivity because the primary effect is on the nervous system. It affects more systems in the body, but the nervous system is one of them. Uh, and it came from um, telegraph operators who were plugging in the, you know, the links for the telephones um, or the telegraphs then. And um, they developed this illness. It went to court and they won. Um, their hours were reduced because they were, they were collapsing. They were having bleeding episodes. Like it was really quite serious how the women were, and it was mostly almost entirely women who were affected. And then um, it was called microwave sickness during the war when they uh, first started using radar. 
And all the symptoms of neurasthenia were identical to microwave sickness. Um, and that was the sort of the second wave. And then eventually, um, originally the only source of exposure was um, antennas near airports and, and military installations, right? And now we've got Wi-Fi in schools, we've got it in our homes, we've got microwave radiation absolutely everywhere that we never had. I have one picture of the globe where we compare 2004 uh, to about 2020, let's say, huge change in Wi-Fi everywhere globally, particularly in you know Europe and, and North America, but certainly globally. And the levels are just going up astronomically. With 5G, we've now got yet another huge increase in our exposure. And so more and more people are getting sensitive because their level of tolerance is, is being exceeded. The World Health Organization didn't like the term electro hypersensitivity. So they recommended idiopathic environmental intolerance, which means we don't know the cause of something in the environment that's affecting these people. They said, this is real, it's debilitating, um, but we'd like to call it idiopathic environmental intolerance. And that's because we don't know what's actually causing it. And when they first came up with this in 2004 at a meeting in Prague that I attended, um, I thought it was a cop out. And you, you sort of reacted, David, when I said idiopathic <laughs> environmental intolerance. And um, I thought about it a lot um, and it's not a cop out. Uh, there are a lot of things can make people electrically hypersensitive precursors to it. And we've come up with five or six now. And that helps doctors treat the patients because if you've developed electro hypersensitivity because you had a concussion that's affected your central nervous system, um, you treat that person differently than someone who has a very high mercury load, either from you know, eating too much fish or from having mercury amalgam fillings or from having a lot of vaccines, you know, whatever the cause, if you've got high loads of mercury and you're electrosensitive, a doctor would treat that person very differently than someone who was sensitive because of concussion. So by working with people for such a long time, we know that some of the precursors, we know how to help some of them. Um, and we're, you know, getting more and more doctors involved. The medical community is beginning to embrace this uh, because they have patients coming in that they can't treat because they go home into a toxic environment and all their symptoms reoccur, whatever they are. So you can't yeah. treat the symptom unless you treat the cause. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the things that we were talking about earlier, and I think I'm very grateful to people like yourself, Magda, because it's the area of research that you work in is obviously um not accepted by a business is it it's you know it hurts their pocket so the fact that you push through and many people like you push through but i was really startled how many hundreds of ems scientists worldwide know about this but they're not able to voice that you know they don't get media time on the mainstream to really share this with the public which is why these sessions that we're having here are very very important for the public to see firsthand you know an expert like yourself saying yeah this is very real it's not just some theory, is it? I mean, when you think in your industry, the, I can't imagine that anyone can look at those studies and not think, hang on, something's not right here. I agree with you entirely. It's just like, you know, but with a lot of environmental stressors, um, whether we're talking about lead or mercury or, you know, asbestos or whatever, the industry has to get its back up, right? Because their job is to, you know, maintain their you know, economic balance and, and make it positive. Um, so they're going to deny it. And they're not the ones you go to to get information. You go to independent scientists who aren't being funded by the industry. Unfortunately, a lot of scientists are funded by the industry and they will simply spout the industry, you know, how they can live with themselves, I don't know. But, but yeah. so our <laughs> scientific system is actually affected because if the editors don't recognize the value of the research, um, then it won't get published. And if it's not published, it's not science. You know, it has to be published in a peer reviewed journal for credibility. Um, and so there's problems there. There's problems with funding. I've never received a penny of funding for all the research I've done. It's all been out of pocket with other people, you know, contributing different things to it. Um, so there's a funding problem. There's a publication problem. 
um, there's a problem with acceptance by the medical profession because their medical authorities are saying, you know, this doesn't exist. It's not in our records. Um, and so it's really hard to convince medical doctors who aren't familiar with this to accept it as an issue. Um, and then there's the political system that a lot of the, our um, government agencies have been infiltrated by the, the technology, the uh, industry. And so Health Canada, which is our health authority, sets the guidelines and they've set the guidelines as something that is no longer useful. It's a heating effect. And so yeah. we're having people reacting at levels that are less than 1% of the Canadian guideline. And in the UK, you've got one of the worst um, health protection, you know, radiation protection agencies. It It is so corrupt. I, I can't believe that it's still functioning. Uh, you've got some of the worst guidelines in the world and the Canada and the US are not far behind. So, you know, getting the government to establish appropriate guidelines is really hard because they've been infiltrated by industry and they get money from industry. And same with the yeah. media, you know, they won't report on it. He who pays the piper chooses the tune. But I think, I certainly think when I talk to a lot of people in the campaign around this very important subject, it's changing, isn't it? When you think about what it was like two years ago to what it's like today, people really, hang on a minute, you know, when there's enough smoke coming out the kitchen, people begin to ask. And I think that's what I say to people now is I think when enough studies and particularly, I think what's happened in the last two years, people have started to, when they're told many, many things and then they turn out not to be true, they start to question the person telling them, you know, it has to happen. You know, it's the, the boy that cried wolf, isn't it? So I think certainly, you know, that's why I'm very grateful for the work that you've done and many of the other scientists in just continuing with this. And particularly with the audience, if you, you know, if you experience yourself uh, an improvement in your health and really... There's so much in the campaign that's needed. I know there's so many campaigners in this country that, you know, they work tirelessly for no money trying to get these masks, not, you know, in, in, make sure they don't get erected near schools. Yeah. I know there was a big one recently, uh, I think it was in Biden, where they were trying to put a 5G mask up right next to a school and the campaign managed to get, you know, it stopped. It's just craziness. You know, you don't need a mask right next to a school, do you? It's... Yeah, we need to protect our children. So, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for coming on, Magda. And, yes, it would be lovely to have you time in the future where we can iron out these technical difficulties. But the reason we do this, because we really want the, the viewers to have this kind of connection with, with the people that we speak to. You know, we want this to be this seamless, you know, having access to this information. So, you know, thank you for your wonderful insights, and uh, it's been lovely to meet you. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you. Um, can uh, Jennifer. I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and Magda, maybe you can help with this too, because I'm sure a lot of people listening would like to know. Um, you talked a little bit about just um, identifying with the, um, the frequency meter. What about um, anything that we could use to protect ourselves? Because there's all these little attachments you can put on your phone and your computer. How effective are these? And I know I've heard about the, there is paint that you can put on your walls to to help. I mean, I think this is all resource information everyone wants to know about. And then it, you know, of course it crosses over even to, you know, water and, and how you keep it all pure. Uh, is there, do you have uh, information that you can tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, there's actually, it's, it's a growing industry because people don't want to be exposed. So shielding yourself is definitely possible. Um, there's paint, as you mentioned. Um, there's wallpaper that's impregnated with um, uh, a carbon compound that also absorbs the radiation. And that's better than paint because if you paint your home and then you leave um, and you've got rooms in there that are shielded against RF radiation and someone moves in who uses their cell phone, their cell phone is going to power up even more because of the shielding. So. Paint is a iffy thing because it's hard to remove, um, but you could put wallpaper up, for example, that will do the same thing. Um, there's fabric that is um, consists of silver fibers uh, that will shield against the radiation. And what people do is they put them up as curtains, for example. It lets the light in, but it doesn't let the radiation and blocks it by about 95 to 99 percent, depending on the mesh size. Um, they also put it on as a canopy around their beds so they can sleep. So they're, if they're in an environment, unlike David, you know, who um, was able to reduce it 
Uh, if you can't reduce your exposure, you can put a canopy around your bed. It's all around your bed, including under the bed. And this produces a Faraday cage and it helps sleep. So that's another thing that you can do. There's film you can put on your windows and some people who drive around and are affected by the antennas as they're driving will put this shielding, this film on their windows and it'll block the radiation considerably. Um, so there's a lot of products like that that do work. Um, then there are devices that you can put either on your phone, on your computer or on your body. And many of them have not been appropriately tested. Um, we've tested a few of them and they've had some minor beneficial effects, but not for everyone. So just like not everyone is sensitive to this radiation in a way that they develop symptoms, not everyone benefits from these devices. And in some cases, the devices don't actually work. And they give people the false sense that, oh, I can be exposed and I'm okay. We're actually working with a few developers testing their products. And so far, we haven't come up with anything that tests um, tests well with a lot of different people. So we're, we're working on that. The other thing I just wanted to mention very briefly, because I realize our time is up, um, uh, with electro hypersensitivity, we're actually working on a questionnaire for the public and for doctors to use with their patients so they can determine to what degree they're electrically hypersensitive. And we've also got an organization called the Global EMF um, Monitoring Project. And there we've got volunteers from around the world monitoring radiation in their environment using the same meter that um, Oliver used earlier. And we're putting that on a map um, so anyone's got access to it. The next thing we're going to do is measure cars um, to look at cars that have low uh, radio frequency radiation. And the website for that is globalemf.net. So to look at the map and to zoom in on it, um, someone in your community may have already done measurements. We have very few people from the UK, by the way. We have a lot of people from Canada and the United States and from other countries in the world, but we could certainly use more people from Europe and the UK uh, for this. So that's what we're working on, uh, trying to help people determine if they're electro hypersensitive, what they're reacting to and how to clean up their environment. Um, and then uh, uh, helping them with exposure in their communities. Well, it's a wealth of information. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'm not surprised to hear that um, that these products, because they're, you know, pushed out so quickly and it's a, you know, quick way to, to make money at the expense of people's fear. And so I'm really glad to hear that you're involved in uh, testing these. And um, is there another site we sh that we should be watching to see the value of different products? Just an assessment. There's a really good site. It's called the electrosensitivesociety.com, electrosensitivesociety.com. And there, um, a really good friend of mine um, uh, runs the website and she helps people who are electrically hypersensitive. She does one-on-one -on -one counseling. She does all sorts of amazing things. Um, she's got a technique that deals with trauma because this causes trauma in individuals and you have to deal with the trauma as well. You have to reset the brain, um, not to be afraid of this radiation. And so she does that type of work with medical doctors as well. So the electrosensitivesociety.com is a really good one. Uh, if you go to Zori Glazier, Z-O-R-Y-G-L-A-S-E-R, um, that particular site, dot com, uh, that particular site has um, references dating back to the late 1800s that have been done on this. Um, we got that from a microwave a expert who worked for the U.S. Navy. Uh, and we've taken all of his documents and uh, scanned them and put them on the website. So if you want to look at older references, how the safety codes were designed, it's all there on that particular website. So it's zoriglazier.com. Um, so those are, you know, some really good websites for people to go to. This is wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for your wealth of information. I wonder if at some point in the very near future, we could bring you back and also your very close friend from the Electrosensitive Society. You think that's a possibility? Because Definitely. She'd, she'd love to she'd help. Love to help. Uh, she's been really good with people all over the world. Um, so she, she's fantastic, um, has incredible patience to work with these people who are really, really suffering. That would be amazing because that's what this is all about in the connection room. So thank you so much. Uh, 
Do you have any questions there from anybody else? I've been kind of occupying. Uh, um, yeah, I'm time. conscious that we've we've taken up your time, Meg. So very thank you very much for your help, and we will we will reach out to to meet again and you know smooth these technical problems out. But I think the information was really gold that you shared. So thank you very much, uh, and thank you for your work. You're very um, welcome. And and I think just wrapping up, maybe Oliver, did you want to just come back to share with the UK listeners the uh, place they can also? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, yes, well, one of our main campaign websites is RF Info, so Radio Foxtrot Info. Co. Uk, and I cross reference a lot of the sites that Magda just shared as well, um, and the tips and uh, ways to mitigate it. Uh, plus also the backgrounds of the political history and the scientific evidence and so on. On the home page, there's a, there's a click through to our masks uh, objection sort of resources. It's just the stuff, you know, we're not, we need everybody contributing, of course, but it, it, we've sort of put together what we feel are the most powerful, relevant arguments according to planning law and so on at the moment. So we try to keep it pretty up to date. And uh, also there's the Action Against 5G website, where, which follows the Michael Mansfield case and the new grounds for appeal. And that's got amazing resources. All the legal actions are listed there, which have been taken across the world. Uh, it's quite a, it's a staggering list, isn't it? The amount of legal actions over the last 10, 15 years. And the very crucial FCC versus CHT one in August 2021. It's staggering. 11,000 pages of evidence. And of course, the FCC was sent back to do their homework. Yeah, but that doesn't seem to have a dent on changing any regulations, of course. But I think the other thing to point out is that a lot of the campaigners have had a lot of success in stopping a lot of the masks, haven't they? I mean, particularly in Britain, some of the places. Well, it's interesting. The masks in Britain, the um, and actually in Britain, Magda, the five G is still the four G LTE. Basically, it's the new new Radio One spectrum, uh, sub six gigahertz. We don't have the millimeter wave yet, but we do have the beam forming in some of the low frequency masks apparently it's very hard to get a straight answer out of any of the engineers uh not because they're feeling suspicious i think they just don't know um but uh the what was i saying the resources for the planners da, 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 how planning. many masks have they we've managed to uh, the campaigners have managed to object to yeah, about 60 to 70 percent of mar new masks are refused but that that's actually just on grounds of citing an appearance. Well, officially, we, we're not sure that many councillors at all have taken on board the health arguments, let alone use them. They might be turning them down under the official criteria of citing an appearance, the very narrow interpretation of that constriction or restriction. And they might secretly be wanting to do it for public health reasons, but we haven't seen any evidence for that. It's just about filming. Uh, but I think any questions, I'm sure, from the public, from the audience. There is a website that allows you, that uh, basically documents where all the different generation um, uh, cell towers are globally. Uh, I'm trying to find it on my computer because it's not something I use on a regular basis, but I'll try to find it before this ends. And if I can, I'll send it to David and he can send it out to everyone. So it's a, it's a site that shows you, you can zoom in on any country, any city, and it'll show you where the 5G is, 4G, 4G, LTE, 4G, all of that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, thank you, Magda. And I think the takeaway here is that we will, uh, obviously there's a lot of websites that have been listed. So I think for for ease, we we get a little post together. We post those on the Telegram group so they can know what to access. But there's certainly, a, I think the good news is there's certainly a wealth of information here. There's a lot of brilliant people working on this. Um, so yeah, there's I think there's going to be a, a, a season of change going forward. So thank you very much to the guests. It's been wonderful. We did have another guest, Sean. I don't know if, if Sean's there, uh, uh, Jennifer or uh, Emma, just to, he quickly wanted to say something. Or if there was any uh, last questions, Jennifer, that you're aware that coming from the audience? Hello. Hi, sir. We can hear you. All right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Sean. So maybe if you could give us just a minute or two of the paper that you had published and the, the letter um, that you and Karen spoke about? Yeah, my letter to the government was published on Principia Scientific website, and it's it's receiving a lot of different attention and is being shared uh, widely, which is really good. 
um, the intention behind the letter was to um, contact all of the government, each one of them by email, sending them the same letter and basically confront them with the information. Um, and it's received backing from scientists and um, other interested parties, campaigners, and really it's just an addition really to getting the information out to, to the right people or maybe the wrong people as well, we'll find out. Um, so it's, it's just putting the information between their eyes. I know that's what we're all trying to do, um, but that was just my effort. And um, it's, it's leading to some very interesting contacts and opportunities to help promote, um, you know, the, the very real danger of 5G and wireless technology. Sean, are you able to share your letter? Possibly put it in the chat. And if you'd like to come on screen uh, with Magda, we'd, we'd love to meet you visually too. Oh, I, I haven't got my video set up. I'm just a voice <laughs> right now. But, yes. but I think the key point is that we often think, you know, not one person can make a difference, but it's usually the, the few people that do when you look through history. So really, I've been so inspired by so many of the campaigners where they just they say, right, I've had enough of this, and they just take it upon themselves, and they, and they really get things done. So I think that's, and when we collectively put our efforts together, I think we can do amazing things. So I think that's really a, probably a lovely um, note to finish on, but... Certainly, we're going to put a post together of all these resources, and and certainly we'd love to have Magda back and and, and have a conversation Thank in the future, and we, and we can collect. Uh, so, if anyone does have any questions by uh, that they haven't had answered tonight, then please pop those in the Telegram channel. We can collect those and, and address those. Okay, so, I just posted my letter in in the chat, so it's there for anybody who wants to read it. Thank you. And, and I think, um, you know, obviously, when we're doing things like this, we're going to have the odd technical hiccup. You know, we, we don't have the large resources of these big corporations, but hopefully you'll see the authenticity of this, where we want to bring the science directly to the public. And we really want everyone to see it. And you'll see the, you know, when you see independent scientists, you'll see that they're doing it because they care. And they're really concerned with the truth. It's not it's not because they, they have something else to gain. So. Thank you to all our guests, and um, yes, we will see you again in the connection room soon. So um, that's over from us. Thank you all. Bye. Thank Bye. you, and join us again next week. We'll have another interesting talk and interactive with everybody. This was wonderful. Thank you. It's brilliant. 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 Have a lovely evening, a lovely uh, rest of your week all. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.